Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again uh, to our show, bringing you another really wonderful guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow uh, on many different fronts. There's so many people out there. Uh, today, we have the honor uh, of being joined uh, by uh, Lois Pace, who is Assistant Secretary uh, for Global Affairs at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, where in her current role, she is responsible for advancing uh, the United States international health agenda through various multilateral and bilateral forums uh, and reporting directly to uh, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services. She is the Office of Global Affairs lead on setting our priorities and policies that help promote American uh, public health agencies and interests worldwide. Uh, Ms. Pace oversees uh, HHS engagement with foreign governments and international institutions, uh, as well as policymaking bodies, including the G7, the G20, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, and the World Health Assembly. Uh, previously, she served as president and executive director of the Global Health Council and was also a member of the Biden-Harris Transition COVID-19 Advisory Board. And while at the Global Health Council, she advocated for increasing our federal investments in global health uh, in the face of budget cuts to uh, the CDC, to the uh, USAID, and us, of course, our, our relationship with the WHO. And prior to her role uh, at the Global Health Council, she uh, spent over a decade working with community-based organizations and grassroots leaders in countries across Africa. Africa and Asia on campaigns calling for person-centered access to health, including with groups like the American Cancer Society, Catholic Relief Services, and the Livestrong Foundation. Additionally, she has held positions in various uh, other global and regional advisory committees and boards that focus on equity and inclusion. Uh, she holds a, a bachelor's degree with honors in human biology from Stanford, a master's degree in international health and human rights with distinction uh, Delta Omega from Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and we are honored to have her with us today. Um, welcome, Assistant Secretary Lois Pace, to our show. Thank you very much, Sharon. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, it, it was it was fascinating because you know I was reading you know and, and watching a lot of your your previous presentations, and uh, recently an article was written about you uh, in the Lancet. It was entitled "Lois Pace: Equity, Solidarity, and Humility in Global Health." And in this article, you know, you sort of talk about how you know, you're studying biology, you, you were initially headed into medicine, and then you so-called stumbled uh, into the public health area. Uh, talk a little bit, if you would, about your background and a little bit about, you know, how you sort of set off on this really unique path you've been on in the public health domain. Yeah, I think stumbling is is right. Um, I There wasn't a public health discipline at the undergraduate level, at least, when I was sort of making my way through university. And, uh, you know, once I fell into it, it, it made sense. But I think I was just grappling with a few things. One is I was very much a science nerd, a STEM nerd. You know, I really liked the math and sciences, including um, biology in particular. Um, but I also found myself quite fascinated with and interested in human behavior, right? What really makes us tick? So it was sort of this combination of things that I found myself being drawn towards. And I didn't really know what to do with it. I ended up teaching. Um, I ended up um, sort of doing other sort of community volunteer roles. Um, but eventually, uh, I was doing health fairs, uh, again, just on a volunteer basis back in my hometown, which you probably read about. And um, I was approached about a role that would pay me to do that type of work, <laughs> which was very exciting for me. Uh, and it allowed me to, you know, to give back, of course, which is also always been in my DNA, but really 
kind of tackle this issue at the intersection of, again, human bodies and human behavior. Like, how do we nudge individuals and communities towards wellness, right? And recognizing the systemic or institutional barriers to that, um, there's still very much a role that we play using the power that we have, uh, especially as a, as a girl from inner city LA, um, not to mention, you know, looking at people who are trying to do this in, in other parts of the world with those limited resources. So that's, that's how I got here. And here we are, you know, 20, 30 years later. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I, I thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be interesting before we get to some of what you're doing now to sort of look at some of these public health themes that you've been involved with the last decade or so, because I think they they highlight sort of what you've been up to and why you're so you know important in what you're currently doing. And I thought an interesting place to go would be some of your, uh, you know, the peer reviewed literature that you published over the last decade. Uh, a couple interesting papers, as you were just mentioning about sort of the, the disparities. One, um, when you were at the American Cancer Society back in 2011, where you published on the uh, the topic of uh, so-called breast cancer civil society, sort of mm-hmm. referring to this, uh, the non-governmental organizations that we don't normally think as much about in, in helping uh, in, in alleviating this disparity. So a role of breast cancer civil society in different resource settings. And then also um, at the Livestrong Foundation, you also published uh, looking at this paper in 2018, looking at the barriers to how uh, in, you know, uh, sort of uh, younger cancer patients mm-hmm. that we don't normally think about because we normally think about cancer as a, maybe an older person's disease. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the issue when we get to some of these really expensive therapies, a lot which we profile on the show, yeah. if we can't afford them, no. Uh, so talk a little bit about sort of some of the things you were involved in on, on the cancer front in the uh, in the last decade, if you would. I'm really, I'm really grateful for this question um, because it gives me the opportunity to say, really um, what set me off on this path um, and who set me off on this path. More importantly, um, the community of cancer survivors, not just in this country, but around the world have really shaped my view of how public health, in my opinion, is done right and done well. And that can only be done by engaging the very individuals or communities we're trying to have an impact on. And it's, you know, that's something obviously we know intuitively and that people certainly preach, but to have it be practiced in such a fundamental way, I think still presents some challenges when you look at certain programs or organizations. And what I was able to do in some of those places you mentioned was work directly with people affected by cancer, whether they had lived with cancer themselves and had made it through treatment or still in active treatment, or unfortunately had lost someone to, to cancer. They had this direct experience and they were always able to say what it was they truly needed. Right. (laughs) And, and, and what really mattered to them. So if we pick up where I left off earlier, talking about the work I was doing in LA, Mm -hmm. I was meeting women, you know, here I was trying to get black and brown women and men into screening services primarily. And, you know, these folks were like, well, look, I got a job that has me busy, you know, um, if I even have access to care, right? Um, it's really hard for me to take the bus down to this place um, to, to you know, get this mammogram, right? Or get this prostate cancer screening like you're recommending. And even just having that conversation, knowing where to meet people to have that conversation was important. And so folks were like, look, you know, you can have this health fair and maybe hope that I show up, but it's a lot easier if you come to the community meeting that, you know, me and my church is having, or, um, you know, we're doing as a fraternity or sorority, or I found myself in barbershops and beauty salons and in laundromats, you know, sharing these messages and really understanding again, what, what people needed. And these are just people at risk, let alone people who, who experienced um, cancer. And it, you know, it was really helpful over the years to again hear firsthand what people were grappling with. We talk a lot about health and technology and there have been really important um, studies that involve cancer survivors, that involve their families, that help us know how they're using you know, these devices we hold in our hands and what they actually wanna see first come up on a search <laughs> rather than you know, some programmer or even some provider. Um, and that just, I mean, it was sort of the same around the world. And again, I just can't say enough how much I appreciated the people with whom I've worked 
um, especially at that time in my career, um, I, I ended up not just working with cancer survivors in the U.S., but with survivors in the Philippines and Thailand and Nigeria and South Africa and in so many places who, again, weren't, um, you know, this wasn't sort of the typical setup that people often think of when it comes to work outside the U.S. or, or work right. abroad, sure. where we decide, oh, we think you need this thing and we're, let us come help you. No, these were communities reaching out to groups like American Cancer Society saying, well, actually, we we just started a Philippine Cancer Society or a Nigerian mm. Cancer Society. We're, we see what you're doing out there and we want to push our governments in the same way or mobilize volunteers and funding in a similar fashion or, you know, just otherwise provide these education and services. Can we have some exchange? And so that was also really important for me is not just thinking about starting with the community that's affected, um, but working in partnership with those communities um, and not in sort of this top-down approach. Gotcha. Gotcha. Moving though um, from cancer to HIV then, and then I said, we'll, we'll get to HSS in a minute because um, again, in, in 2018, and, and now you're with the Global Health Council, and this was uh, a paper in The Lancet that you were involved in publishing. It was entitled uh, Advancing Global Health and Strengthening the HIV Response in the Era of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now we're getting uh, sort of into the SDGs. And, you know, here we have this basket, sort of this interesting health and well-being basket that has, you know, other things in it that maybe we as Americans might you know. I don't come across people with malaria or tuberculosis, but mm -hmm. HIV, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that maybe is impacted. You know, a lot of us over the years, and some of that we know, or uh, family members, friends. And again, here we're pointing out that, and I profile, you know, again, on this show, you know, I have guests on that, you know, we're, in the U.S., you know, we're getting pretty close to, I'm saying eradicating this thing, but, you know, amazing drugs that you don't have to take as much anymore and doing things with the stem cells and so forth. But you point out in this paper, no, we got tens of millions of people around the world that still don't have the typical you know, antiviral therapies that we mm -hmm. that were making this thing less of a problem 20 years ago. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your time at the Global Health Council and specifically on this HIV uh, SDG issue. Yeah, that was it an important paper at the time and even now, um, because I think the argument we were making was, you know, HIV has enjoyed a really critical focus um, with regards to investments and policies. And that focus is still key, to be clear. I mean, to your point, the U.S. is actually farther behind some countries in Africa when it comes to people on ARVs, let alone sort of lowering the risk. And so, you know, there's been this interesting conversation lately, how the U.S. Um, can learn from some of these countries in, in Africa, where the where we as a government have invested and sort of worked with those governments and communities to get them to where they are. Uh, but how do we get or reach that last mile, right? Is it by continuing solely to invest in HIV or do we need to be thinking about the broader health system? Because someone living with HIV, again, and talking to people living with HIV and who thankfully are surviving, right? Even if yep. they're contracting it, they're saying, I have all these other issues too, especially if they've been on ARVs this long, there are chronic conditions that come up like heart disease. Um, there are other needs that they have, other important screening services that we could provide like for cervical cancer. And so I think we were trying to push as authors of that, of that paper, um, this, this thinking towards a more holistic approach mm -hmm. uh, to, to HIV. And um, it's something that, we we see happening in the president's emergency plan for for AIDS relief PEPFAR, yep. um, and but in many other areas too. And it and it's the reason I said it was a critical moment is because that was also when finally UHC or universal health coverage started to gain momentum as a mantra. Um, I think as COVID has come, that question or that sort of you know, ambition has been <laughs> revitalized, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because we we know that it ultimately comes down to the system in which people experience health, 
and whether or how that system can survive the shocks that it inevitably faces, right, for the individuals or for these communities. And so we, you know, it's not sexy, right? Like it's hard to actually get out of just sort of this, we would call it at Global Health Council, this game of whack-a-mole where we're sort of right. like, okay, disease X, disease Y, yep. and really move more into this comprehensive person-centered approach to to public health and, and health care. Awesome. So Going now into your your quote role, and I have to admit, you know, I I, um, I look at HHS and it has this motto of you know, impu- improving health, safety, and well being of America. I see the Office of Global Affairs. I I was unaware, and maybe I'm admitting to my stupidity here that that it existed. But, you, you and know, many and, other people are. No worries there. <laughs> but, but I've also, you know, interesting online. I've seen you. Um, your title referred to not just as secretary, but also secretary of state uh, uh, yes. at, at HHS. So it makes me think because you know I just had uh, Assistant Secretary Medina on from the State Department. That's right. <laughs> talking about science diplomacy from sort uh-huh. of an environmental perspective. So I see you as a you know a public health person, but also a diplomat in this kind. Talk yeah. a little bit about the the OGA, your role, yeah. sort of where the directives come from, and a little bit of um, this theme of healthcare diplomacy, which you yeah. are so important in, in championing there. Well, thanks for asking that. And of course, yes, there there is some synergy or alignment with our colleagues at the State Department. But yes, I do sit in the Department of Health, and it is surprising for people to learn that there is a, essentially a health diplomacy division here. I run a team of about 75 um, uh, staff, so it's not it's not nothing, right? And we no. are essentially, you know, we're sort of a window to the world for the health department. Like you said, our mission is certainly to uh, protect um, uh, the health of Americans and and provide um, the health of Americans. And yet one way that we could do that is by engaging with other countries and learning from them how they're addressing issues like cancer or diabetes um, or HIV, right? Which again is still an issue here. You think about the rates even of maternal mortality and in particular how that affects black and brown women um, and indigenous peoples in our country. Hey, that's something that, uh, you know, countries in Latin America and the Caribbean and, and Africa and Asia are grappling with too. So what are the conversations we can have um, to, lift all boats, right? To help each other out. Um, let alone when you think about this pandemic, goodness, how important was it to have an office that countries could call and ask, hey, we really need vaccines. Yeah. And we're wondering if we can work together to make sure that both all of our citizens have access to them. And these weren't just the poorest of the poor countries. And in, in fact, those countries had um, an option through COVAX, um, you know, however challenging that that was to tap into at times. But we're talking about countries like Mexico and Brazil and and India and and other places that might not have had the same uh, entry points. And so that that diplomacy really was powerful. It's not just about also providing goods um, or or even uh, services, but, uh, you know, working together with, uh, say, regulatory authorities in Brazil and Mexico to understand how they're authorizing all these new products that were coming um, yeah. online, right? Same with India. And so another thing that people don't realize is in addition to, to my office, which does sit in the office of the secretary, you also have have international divisions within mm. our CDC, within the FDA, certainly within NIH, right? Yep. HHS has a broad global footprint and that's on purpose, right? Because that is the best way that we've recognized over years of existence, we can actually get this job done and we can actually serve Americans. Wonderful. Wonderful. And, you know, as one of the, the several things that you do, and I know you've been very passionate in speaking about the importance of our engagement with the World Health Organization, yeah. you you represent us uh, on the World Health Assembly, uh, and uh, it was in May of last year that you gave a uh, a talk, well, you, you gave a, a keynote, and then the, the topic was health for peace, peace for health, and then mm. I, you can actually read the whole summary, anyone listening and watching online uh, at HHS, but then um, a couple of days later on May 26th, you were in a sort of a breakout group talking about reimagining global health security, preparing mm-hmm. for 
the next pandemic. Yeah. Talk a little bit about you know your role on the World Health Assembly and and if, whatever you can talk about in terms of some of these uh, breakout discussions and of course something very important based on the the last couple of years that we've gone through uh, mm-hmm. about you know preparing HSS responsibility for preparing globally for yeah okay yeah, so whatever we're facing now or next yeah. <laughs> so um, thanks for highlighting the the role we do play. Um, for the U.S. government with the World Health Organization. Um, Our secretary, our secretary of health is actually our primary representative with them. Um, It's a, you know, WHO and the World Health Assembly is a convening of health secretaries, health ministers, um, how they're, as how they're commonly called around the world. And it's a space for them to come together and, not only exchange ideas or priorities with one another, but importantly, guide WHO in its work. And as you mentioned, the U.S. is now on the board of WHO, so we have an even um, more special role and responsibility in kind of dictating for WHO what we see collectively with other board members as important areas of focus for them. Mm-hmm. Um WHO, of course, under Dr. Tedros's leadership, has had a triple billion strategy. Um, he's referred to mm-hmm. uh, over time. That's going to continue into his into his second term, and that's essentially looking at how many people are protected um, or provided for through universal health coverage. Um, uh, how many people, and again ideally a billion, right, are protected from global health emergencies. Mm -hmm. And then looking also at the important business of a range of health issues from HIV, TB, and malaria to um, maternal and child health, right? And ensuring that we're still not forgetting about that important work. And so we spend um, a lot of time actually uh, working with uh, WHO to balance that, right? And to say, okay, um, while you are so focused on global health emergencies in particular, um, you have to be sure that um, we're not sort of losing progress Mm -hmm. on a number of other areas where you have been so successful, such as in polio vaccination or eradication, yep. right? Um, and so that that getting that balance right is really important, especially now, again, in the wake of COVID. Um, we want to be sure that uh, that those triple billion targets <laughs> are, yep. are issues on which WHO and all of its member states, almost 200 of us, can advance, right? Um, sort of equitably, simultaneously. Another important goal of WHO that I that I want to be sure I mention as well, and and of the leadership there, Dr. Tedros, is um, around how they become more fit for purpose, right? Mm-hmm. How they can be a more effective, efficient organization, and you know this is key, right? They are they're celebrating their seventy fifth anniversary this year, um, so it's been a while that they've been in place. And the U.S. was you know one of um, its founding members. But we know that WHO has had to evolve over time, and and that sure. time includes the the moment we're in now. And so there are, there are a number of recommendations that we as member states have made, um, and even proposals that WHO themselves have put have put on the table with regards to how they change, how they shift, you know, how they show up in a different way for what the world needs now. We do have the immediate lesson of COVID, but we also had lessons before COVID, and we'll have lessons after COVID. And the key. I think, and we believe, is to ensure we have an agile, um, sort of uh, effective organization that can evolve um, as needed, you know, um, given the the broader global health ecosystem. The onus also isn't just on WHO to do that, but it's also on us as members of WHO to think about how we change the way we do business as well. I mean, the president has talked about building back better and that applies to to all of us yeah. and so one of the things that our office leads here in addition to guiding who is looking at some of those tweaks to the system itself and one major uh, initiative that we've been undertaking since last year is how the world revisits international health regulations mm. so these are the policies and standards that really help 
WHO and the rest of the world uh, respond to, let alone prevent, uh, public health emergencies. We ideally wouldn't have ended up in the pandemic we're in, right? right. Um, and I, I'd say that because we had international, some international health regulations, right, we were able to make moves um, so that we could move goods around the world appropriately, yep. we could share information, right? There's still some important revisions that have to be made to those regulations, which is what the US has been leading on. And we've been joined by so many other countries who agree with us, which is great. Um, but that's, you know, that's on all of us um, mm -hmm. to, to help change. Um, so again, WHO is prepared um, to do better and right by the world in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, while we're um, on that to this topic um, with the WHO, I, I mentioned um, in your bio that you, know, you have responsibility on President Biden's uh, COVID-19 advisory board. And then I was also reading that um, <laughs> One of your your many responsibilities is also serving on uh, one of the uh, the tracking and accelerating progress working group of the uh, the Act Accelerator, the COVID nineteen Tools Accelerator, and I, you know it's um, it's such an interesting when you see I, I love sort of these I don't call moonshots, but these mm. really sort of mega projects that we need, and this Act is one of them. Yeah. Um, you know, I had the Senator Lieberman on uh, a couple months yeah. ago talking about the the bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. There, yeah. you know, they're thinking about a hundred billion dollars or so. To, to deal with that stuff. Um, but you've been really at the, the center of all, I mean, ACT is no joke in terms of, you know, putting together the billions required in that specific case for COVID. Uh, talk just, to, if you would, take us through a little bit of yeah. your time per the accelerator. I think this is an important piece. Yeah, thanks for that. You know, um, it, it was an important initiative uh, that was stood up um, not long after uh COVID was declared a public health emergency of international concern. And you had a set of actors mainly in Geneva, but also from other parts of the global health community who said, okay, what can we do in this moment? What do we have to offer now? Um, there was not something like an ACT accelerator at the time, which is why they had to build it. Although there had been very recently, before then, discussions about how WHO could work better with organizations like the Global Fund um, against or to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, or Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, let alone the World Bank and some of these other institutions that receive a good deal of funding to do a good deal of good around the world, mm -hmm. but they weren't they weren't necessarily playing all that well in, in the same sandbox, if we're being honest. And so, um, and I was even a, a member of this uh, civil society advisory group who was trying to push for that higher, more effective level of collaboration across all these global institutions. Mm. Um, and that wasn't necessarily gaining a lot of traction. It took COVID as sort of a forcing <laughs> event yeah. to, to bring those same organizations together in ways that, governments and in, in particular countries that they they serve um were had been asking for for some time mm -hmm. so i think that was the you know that was a one positive um outcome of an act a is those same organizations and donors frankly could really um come together right and and like find ways <laughs> to figure that out um in the wake of an of an emergency as you as you well know, and as I'm sure people who are listening have been tracking, Act A or the Act Accelerator was organized in several different buckets, um, namely the kind of how we get vaccines to the world, how we also provide diagnostics or tests, importantly, so we understand what the heck is going on with COVID sure. worldwide. And then, um, you know, how we how we provide um, treatments, including oxygen, right? We didn't always have right. things like oral antivirals, but we had some early stage needs, um, and especially, you know, before we even had vaccines. And they also were, were looking at kind of, again, back to this health systems question, how those, you know, the workforce and other important elements could be bolstered um, in the emergency. So that was a... 
you know, that group came together and did a lot to try and mobilize resources, mobilize those goods and really sort of distribute them to the world. They had a clear vision, at least, um, for equity and equitable distribution or delivery. Um, And I think, you know, we saw and heard some of the challenges of that Mm -hmm. of that process. Um, And and so, you know, I want to also say how important it is that we learn from the ACT Day experience. And in fact, now um, ACT Day is transitioning, right? It's it talks okay. the those same organizations and institutions talk openly about their transition, especially because even though COVID is not going away, right? At mm-hmm. least not right now, mm-hmm. the 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 moment has shifted, right? Um, or the needs have shifted rather. And so there's a question of how those same organizations continue to work together, particularly if and as there are surges, because we still are unable to anticipate that entirely with COVID-19. But importantly, there's a follow-on question, which is, well, how do we come together if there's something else? Right. Right? Like, what do we do um, in the wake of an Ebola crisis or Mm. cholera or, you know, other emergencies or issues? Now, the good news is there are, There is a system for that, right? And in in some ways, these organizations already had something in place for those couple of diseases I named. But, you know, if you have another situation where you don't know what this is, right? Or you don't have a vaccine or a treatment or test already, then you really do arguably need some sort of mechanism or network that's established um, and can be turned on more immediately, right? You know, bring in the funding, bring in the brains and bodies and really deliver for the world. And that's that's a critical piece of this too, right? Knowing, I mean, we as, as U.S. government have been saying this, uh, at least since this administration has been in place, you know, it's important that we support that level and type of global collaboration, but it needs to truly be global, right? Mm-hmm. It needs mm-hmm. to involve, um, uh, it needs to get beyond go- the government or public sector, arguably, and include yeah. civil society and include industry. But maybe most importantly, we have to be sure the representation is right. And this is, of right. course, what I learned from early days working with the cancer community. You know, nothing about us without us. People say it in HIV, people say it in so many circles, but again, we have to live and breathe that. So where is African Union and the Africa CDC, you know, when it comes to this new mechanism, if there's going to be a new network for disease X, where do does the Caribbean community come into play or some of similar associations in Southeast Asia or Latin America? Like those roles have to be carved out um, and well outlined so that all of these important communities um, and powers, frankly, are brought to the table for the contributions that they can make. And in particular, for the impact any decisions will have on their countries and citizens. That um, that leads perfectly, I mean, it segues perfectly into, into my next talking point because uh, just, uh, uh, a couple of months ago, um, you know, you announced uh, your group uh, and its funding of uh, this really interesting antiviral research program, which is a collaboration between uh, Mahari Medical College, oh, yeah. Howard University, Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, Charles Drew University. Um, and again, uh, with a focus on the HIV epidemic, yeah. Africa, and specifically ad- adolescent girls and young women. Uh, and you also brought in, you know, again, looking at sort of the partnership, you, you brought in Pep far as you were mentioning before and yeah. also the uh, uh the health resources service administration or the yeah. part of hhs talk a little bit about this collaboration because i think it's a I, I love what i hear sort of I, I won't call this sort of venture capital but sort of the seed funding of these really interesting sort of uh academic collaboration sort of uh public yeah project. thanks a lot for asking about that and you know hhs actually has a a a long-standing relationship with HBCUs in particular. Um, we've been able to leverage that relationship um, globally when it comes to programs like PEPFAR, um, really drawing on their interests in, in some of the same communities. Um, you know, what you're speaking to, the the investments that we've made um, with, with Meharry and in particular and, and the research there is really our effort here at HHS to ensure the communities that have 
been most affected and and arguably left behind are a part of um, the solutions, right? Mm -hmm. We still need to close some really important gaps when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to access to innovations. I've said before, you know, innovations without access will not have an impact (laughs) in the way that they need to. Um, It won't work if people are left out. And, And the reality is not everyone is benefiting still from these important innovations. And so how do we change that, right? Well, we change yep. it by ensuring that they work for them um, and not just the you know drugs or vaccines themselves, um, but the delivery thereof, right? Like what are the messages that need to be in place to drive demand um, and to really, again, kind of close close those, those gaps and, and lessen those disparities in, in specific communities. The, the pandemic fund is, is also something that was launched in the in the past year and that the U.S. had a heavy hand in in visioning uh, and in driving with with other countries around the world and and including the G20 but but even beyond and that's going to be an important part of this too um, because that also creates the space to again invest in important um, countries and communities that don't typically um, sort of benefit from that level of engagement, um, Mm -hmm. but who have possibly the most vested interests in the outcomes of said (laughs) initiatives. And so, uh, and I know we're looking forward to to how that evolves and ensuring that, you know, both these efforts, right, as as various investments um, or funds are launched, you know, they're inclusive and and they really bring in or crowd in um, the people who are often missing from these conversations. Outstanding, really outstanding. Um, I noticed that uh, in a couple months, well, no, a couple, well, yeah, in, in a beginning of April, uh, you're going to be attending the uh, the World Vaccine Congress uh, in Washington. Uh, the theme of this year is R and D and strategic partnering for the the vaccine industry. Um, what else is is hot and happening uh, for you in sort of the first couple months of 2023? Other forums where we can listen to you, meet you, and then obviously any anything else coming up that I did not touch on uh, <laughs> that you might want to highlight per per the OGA, please. Well, what is keeping me busy? Goodness, uh, so many things. There, um, you know, in addition to working with with WHO and, and leading for the for the U.S. there, we and namely my boss, the secretary, is responsible for our participation in the G7 and G20 when it comes sure. to health dialogues, yep. and so quietly that also keeps us quite busy because you have these forums where you know it's a smaller set of countries but still an important group um, of governments that ask well how should we be coming together around health going into the future whether it's around pandemics and preparedness or around universal health coverage right and health Mm -hmm. systems or health workforce those conversations are going to uh, remain <laughs> quite important. Um, we've been engaged in them the past couple of years, um, and um, we're, we'll continue to do so in the the coming months and and throughout this year. And something else on the horizon for us is sort of a, a trio of high level meetings that will take right. place at the United Nations. And of course, the the UN talks about a range of of topics and issues, but health has been high on their agenda for obvious reasons the past few years. And this year, there is a high level meeting on pandemic preparedness and response. There's one on UHC, there's another on TV. So we'll be very busy here in your office of global affairs at the Department of Health, again, trying to help with others in the US government develop our recommendations um, or positions going into those those conversations or commitments. Um, so those are some things that I'm tracking at a at a global level. We also are very engaged at a at a regional um, and bilateral um, level or basis. So I wouldn't I wouldn't want to forget that. You know, there's really 
um, great collaborations um, with uh, the ASEAN countries um, and other countries um, across um, Asia through the APEC conference and series cool. of, of, of meetings we're hosting here in the U.S. this year. Um, there's also obviously um, a really important engagement we have still with the Africa CDC and the African Union. Their summit is happening as we're as we're speaking uh, this week, um, and so that. That work continues and that work is important because, you know, often, as you can imagine, at a global or international level, we can miss uh, important nuances um, and kind of special issues or circumstances and contexts that come up at um, at a regional or national level. And so given the way HHS works, again, across all the of our various agencies, we really try and take advantage of this bottom up approach as well. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yeah, you, you, you no doubt are going to be quite busy and uh, and on the go. But I mean, I, I, it clearly, you know, it, you know, everything we've just talked about shows why, you know, you're, you're so perfect in the role that you're in. Oh, I really, thanks. really wish you the best with all this as you continue to uh, to lead us in this sort of uh, global health diplomacy space uh, for our country. And um, just, yeah, I mean, just really wish you the best for a good thing. You know, a, a 2023 with a lot of positive things going on on that front. Um, again, for uh, everybody that is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on our YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Assistant Secretary Lois Pace at the uh, you know, Assistant Secretary of Global Affairs, United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, you can check out her recent presentation at the World Health Assembly, uh, Health for Peace, Peace for Health, uh, on the website. Check out a lot of presentations she's given. Mm -hmm. I, I recommend, highly recommend them. Um, Secretary, I, I really appreciate the time uh, today that you've taken out of your schedule to come on the show. I want to thank you for that. Obviously, thank you for everything you do to promote uh, this global health equity and health security for our country and the world. And as we like to say here on our show, uh, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow via the type of work you do. It's really a very fascinating story. Well, thank you, Ira. I appreciate that very much. Great having you. <laughs>